in Japan, the fact that there's so much abandoned land and so many beautiful places like this, um, you know, there are a lot of opportunities for growing and, um, you know, starting a farm. And I could see a lot more people doing it, but... Hi everyone! This is Seek Sustainable Japan, and I'm JJ Walsh, your host here in Hiroshima, Japan. Usually, these Seek Sustainable Japan uh, talks are with great people doing great things all across Japan, a live show. But this is the second level as I go to visit them on location, people who have previously been on the channel and see what they're doing and they give us a walking tour of their current project. In this episode, I go to visit Thomas Klepfer in Mukaishima Island, just opposite Onomichi in Hiroshima. And he has always been doing amazing things uh, with his no-till farming and his ideas and philosophy about natural farming. And on this visit, he takes me around his new project uh, where they're renovating an old house. And then we go and talk while we're walking around his farm as well. Thomas and Kaori are based in Mukaishima Island opposite the Onomichi port in Hiroshima, Japan. They have a variety of projects and entrepreneur businesses which are really focused on sustainable philosophy of shelter, food, and clothing. In this video, Thomas gave me a walk around their new buildings which they are renovating and they call it Shikiji to literally pull from the ground. The building has a long history, over a hundred years, and it's so inspiring and exciting to see how they are finding ways to reuse it. Good afternoon, konnichiwa. My name is Thomas Klepfer, and welcome to Shikiji. It's uh, an expansion of Pitchfork Farms. Uh, we've been here uh, farming on this island in Mukaishima for 10 years now, and uh, we've just recently started to work on and renovate uh, this space here. Um, yeah, come on in. This week we finally finished framing everything out. Um, the carpenters has been at, hard at work to redo the outside of the building. Uh, my wife's textile company is coming in and actually planning on moving here this week. So uh, it's pretty full on right now. Wow, that's um, great. It looks wonderful. Did you use any like reused wood as uh, well as new? Well, yes, yes and no. I mean, we did have to buy some of the new flooring. Um, the old flooring came out of, I believe, this room and went into this room in the back. But this was new wood we purchased. But we have, in some of the spaces, we have recycled and reused a lot of wood. The framing that'll be on those windows and doors there. And some of the framing from recycled wood um, or upcycled wood is actually hidden as uh, beams inside. So um, we kind of have to mix between the two. Um, well, you've got this great big beam going across the yeah. top here. Wow. Yeah. So this building is about a hundred years old. Uh, originally, um, family. I think uh, it was a man moved here from, moved back to Japan from the U.S. and built this space. And in this space, they used it as a house. Um, I think the second floor was where they slept. In the first floor, they put in a little bit of a kitchen and had uh, some. Uh, like tatami here. A lot of that stuff we've taken out now and replaced with just wood flooring. Cool. Um, recently, uh, after the flooring went down, we put down some uh, kakishibu or the fermented persimmon dye just to stain it. And we might stain it one more time. Um, and we'll continue to stain some of the outside of so the wood. So this is stained. You can see the color difference. Yeah, a right? little bit. We've just applied one layer. So we're going to apply multiple layers over time as the plan. And same with the outside here. Um, we've applied uh, n we haven't applied any of the kakishibu yet here, but the plan is um, to continue to stain it. And that's a great way to, to keep insects away, but right. also it's a beautiful stain on the wood. Yeah, right? it, the color comes out really nice, uh, and especially if you apply it every uh, few seasons. So every season, usually in spring, I apply it. It's fall now, so um, 
Yeah. But Cowdy's company's show space is going to go in here. So this week we're moving her weaving machines, sewing, some of the sewing machines will come in here and she'll use it as a showroom as well. And the second floor she'll uh, stock her um, materials and raw materials and extra equipment um, for when we do events and workshops. So, Speaking of America, are these Jimmy Carter peanuts? I <laughs> don't know. So the carpenter who's hard at work here is also a farmer, of oh. course, and he just dropped these off today. Um, <laughs> I, I got a text message from her earlier saying he dropped these off. So I'm going to do some jo Georgia-style boiled peanuts, All right. I hope. Uh, and we're planning for a, like a pre-open party next week. So my plan is to yeah, boil these and have um, some yeah, good, good old-fashioned bald peanuts. This was our, this was a citrus storage and farm space um, and workspace, and now we are in the process of also restoring and redoing that. I think last time you were here, you probably couldn't, we couldn't walk into the back of there, could we? No. Um, so and you were crawling along the top, pulling off tiles And pulling off the tiles, yeah. <laughs> so we replaced all the tiles. I'm glad you're still alive. I'm still alive, yeah. Uh, I'm, this is kind of what would be used to sort or sh sift uh, seeds a uh -huh. lot of the time. Ooh. So uh, I saw it actually used actually used in Nepal and this mark is it is rice at the top that so exactly so that's this symbol is a mountain uh -huh. that mountain is most likely Takamiyama Ooh. so there's three hills on Takamiyama and rice and then the two kanji here is um, Hiku and Ji we often see this when we see like Jibiru so local Ooh. or this is actually um, Shiki or and shiki ji is the mm -hmm. kanji. Really, you would read it as hiku or hiki ji, but uh, the the owner of this house told us that the local dialect called it shiki ji, which literally uh -huh. means to pull the earth. Yeah. Which is what we're doing here. We're pulling you the earth. No till way. farming. Yeah. But pulling. We'll, That's awesome. We're pulling it up and creating the space. I so, see some really beautiful carpentry happening in here. And that's the next space. So the bar space that we're going to should be in? finished. Yeah, please. Yeah, this is all you, you don't need uh, shoes here or you don't need to take off your shoes here. These are gorgeous. Yeah, we got some uh, some small um, stools here for customers to sit. And then this is made, I believe, by our friend Hashimoto san, Hashimoto Kagu. He's located in Hiro uh, Hiroshima in Higashi Onomichi, and his furniture work is a, is great. We own several of his pieces um, at our house, and we really want to utilize local craftsmen's work here as much as possible. So this was the old barn space or kura. I think last time you were here also was filled with mikan baskets and garbage and so many things. So what we have going here is uh, we're going to use this as like the kitchen bar space. We're also going to work with some local uh, arti artisanal like herb growers and ar artisanal herb tea makers. So they're going to come in here and do workshops and events as well. But we're also going to have this as kind of a pub bar space. Immediately when I walked in the first time, I said, this is a pub, you know, this is our bar space. So Beautiful. Um, hopefully in the next year or so, we'll have um, the bar counter and uh, some taps available. So that's what we're working towards right now. Yeah, the ceiling, the beams up here also just amazing. And we had to replace uh, the corner because the corner was um, destroyed by a large climbing vine. Mm -hmm. It started to knock off the Japanese roof tile or kawara over several years. So as it started to fall down, it exposed the beams above and they got wet and started to rot. Actually, the whole ceiling started to rot. So we replaced that first just before the rainy season this year. And because we're working with a very limited budget, we replaced it using this uh, Nami Ita, uh, just a polycarbonate as a simple, cheap replacement. But that's actually keeping this place alive. You know, had we worked to replace it with the actual original building material, it would have cost uh, five to ten times as much. So we needed it done to be done relatively quickly. And You've got to keep within your budget. Yeah, and which is which was quite you know <laughs> limited. 
Um, we've recently applied for some funding for renovating Cowardy space and, and moving Cowardy's company. So we've recently applied for that budget and we'll be receiving the budget within this year. But um, yeah, in the, in the beginning it was pretty shoestring uh, budget. <laughs> but we're, we're making it happen now. Yeah, it's awesome. So, I'm very excited. First, I removed all the kawara or the roof tiles. Um, we have a neighbor that has a house just below uh, there and garden there. So, you know, we had to do it um, kind of one piece by piece, uh, more or less. And then yeah, we, I want to put the fermenters in here. This is going to be a space for fermentation. Um, what kind of fermenting are you going to do? I hope, hopefully beer. We'll, we're working on that right now. Um, haven't really applied for the licensing process, but we're doing a lot of interviews with other breweries, and we have a brewing um, engineer, beer engineer, coming to look at the property this coming month. So that's going to be the next step. Very cool. And then w just below is the chica or cellar. This was traditionally used for storing citrus. And uh, yeah, it's relatively intact. Drugs. Yeah, the yeah. temperature just dropped. Yeah, it's uh, so but down through here, we imagine being able to put a few fermenters here or store, you know, barrel aged or bottled beers as well. And we can also do bottling and things down here as well. So these are old racks we use for. Uh, storing navel or natsumikan, amanatsu, so these type of fruit that you'd want to pull down before it gets too cold so the, the inside would go bad. Mm -hmm. the, and the crazy thing when we think about things in terms of value, well actually the cost of this building came with the house that we purchased down below, so yeah. it's zero, yeah. zero in house, but um, the furniture was all here. Uh, all this wood was salvaged wood. The windows came off the front of the house, so maybe at some point if we do another remodel or we add on to um, other spaces in the future, we want to put this wood to some use, hopefully. Um, the wood that we can't really use will, you know, when we have a barbecue or campfire here, we'll have it um, for that, so we don't necessarily have to cut down trees to um, provide our some of our firewood. It's very um, cool to see how it was built with the bamboo here and the and the dirt. Yeah, you can basically. really get an idea of like you really how can. people made buildings. You know, mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, piemon and t turnips are here. More more piemon, radish, kushin sai. Uh, this year we put in about 20 uh, citrus trees on this top section. There's a few kaki trees on the property. I think yeah. last time you were here, I don't know if, yeah, we didn't have the roof off. No, the, but, you, um, I saw your YouTube or Instagram live or something yeah. where you're crawling on there, yeah. getting them off by hand. Yeah, yeah, one, just one piece at a time. Amazing. Yeah. So that's all of them here and you're going to reuse them in some way, you said maybe along a stream or something? Yeah, if we can, I mean, maybe along the outside of the edge of uh, roofs and stuff. A lot of people put them in and like they'll crush them up and use them as a French drain. Mm -hmm. um, part, of, like, part of me will just use them like, just like this as like tile on the ground because you know it keeps the grass down and <laughs> well I, I'd like to crush it and use it just as like jadi or some kind of rock material and then also on the foundations of a lot of buildings um, you have to buy you buy in rock anyway to so that's we've used it in previous buildings where we've put down concrete um, so right here there's already a frame this also used to be a building here uh, Kawara or Akura was here. Akura was here, and so uh, maybe we would dig out a lot of the wood here, and when we put down concrete again to build another space here, we could use it for that. Maybe that's where some of that those recycled windows could go in. I can imagine a little like glass building here, um, kind of a cool chill out space would be would also be really nice. Yeah, our citrus trees. These are one year old citrus trees we put in, mm -hmm. and a lot of the beams too. Um, now, originally you were telling me it was a citrus farm that you took over, right? Yeah, this was citrus. Yeah, and our farm was also a citrus farm too. So when we uh, started that um, process, we've now, all the trees were pretty much gone and dead. And same here, this was citrus as well. But, you know, five, ten years of neglect, the trees tend to rot or die because no one is there to care for them. So now we're um, just getting ready to cut the grass here before next week's event and yeah our one year trees are looking pretty good disc golf association and uh, yeah they sent me a used one 
So I was, I said, okay, I'll, I'll buy it. Um, I want to get it tried out. So next week when we have our event, um, you're going to have a Frisbee golf game. Well, yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. If, uh, if you get it a hole in one, you get free beans for a year. That's awesome. What's this? What's happening? Suchidango. Uh, no, uh, Suchidango and there's seed balls inside. So this is the Fukuoka method of reseeding uh, unused or, um, you know, w forest land. So he often was known for making clay seed balls just like this and then filling them with different seeds. There's three or four types of seeds in here. And later on this afternoon, um, Do you just throw request, it in? request of NHK will be going to the forest and throwing our seed balls. Oh, wow, awesome. Yeah, I don't really think it's necessary anymore to do seed balls, but TV thinks it's necessary. So yeah, we'll and it. you're keeping keeping that tradition alive that he started. Yeah, he was he was sending them out of helicopters in Africa. Right, and right? so re, and so in those situations in those places, I think there's a lot of value and there's a lot of merit. But in Japan, the soil and the climate are relatively good, so we can just take like a handful of different seeds and literally just scatter them into the garden, into the yard. This is four types of seeds. Uh, These are things that from your vegetables that you've made seeds from? Yeah, the, some of the, the only seed I bought is this little yellow seed, which is a clover, which I recommend growing in places where you don't want it to be over weeded. Um, clover tends to be a ground cover and flushes out other weeds, so I really recommend that. But then we've got Swiss chard, mustard greens, some turnips, and daikon radish. So the daikon will do the tilling, so will the turnips, the mustard um, becomes forage or food for other animals and other insects. Um, and it's just about multiplying plants and biodiversity in your field or space. So when we go up to the farm or go up to the garden, uh, you know, we have so many plants. So even if we do get some bugs on some of our, you know, vegetables, there's still so much for them to eat. So it's just um, like the bugs will only be... I would say like really would only concentrate in a certain space. They can be trap crops for other plants too and this is what we're now like realizing in this natural farming style that we're doing. Um, that you're exactly going to get germination from these plants every time but there's uh, there is a lot of value to this. Are these mangoes? These are um, popo. Popo, they, so our, our friend the carpenter gave it to us because just recent typhoon they fell. Um, so can you uh, eat them? Yeah, yeah, if they're ripe, but these are unripe, so I'm going to take let's go to the sheep and see okay. the sheep and um, I'll I'm going to feed these to the sheep. Um, so to keep the weeds down a little bit, especially where people are walking, uh, it's really nice to use the the this mulch. We have a wood chipper, but we don't use it as much as I would like right now. Um, eventually we'll be uh, doing more wood chipping here in the forest and then with some of those seeds, we'll throw it out. How do you feel about this larger space? Uh, gonna need more people. <laughs> but it's amazing. I mean, you know, from this side, I would often, you know, I'd often walk up the hill and, you know, just to look down and see the space and to see it change over time is, is awesome, you know? And the fact that it's been sitting abandoned for however many years we got here i feel like just in time you know yeah it's, you ever uh, have time to swim over to your island uh kayak i kayak there a few times this summer uh -huh. uh, me and the neighbors uh two two young kids we went across together and we found oysters on the other side oh wow yeah there was little tiny oysters um like natural naturally float up to the sea so that we took those back and you know they were you know this big but we brought them back to the house and we're like eating them um, eating them up and yeah it's you know it's amazing what you can find just floating over so there's your wood chipper yep yeah it's uh yeah it's a for one person, it's not really the easiest job. So yeah. um, when we have a team of people, I try to get over here and um, yeah, and try to you know, get to work. But yeah. we have a lot. Like it's it's mostly a winter project. You know, when the summer cools down. Yeah. And you know, we have more time. Everything's um, growing so fast right now, right? Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And still, it's so hot. You know. So yeah, it's thirty um, still. It's almost October. Yeah. 
it's 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 kind of crazy which that means there's more bugs uh, I've noticed a lot more grasshoppers this year um, and grasshoppers tend to eat the young uh, immature plants so if you're gonna seed right now you need to cover it with a net because otherwise the grasshoppers will come in and wipe it out like like a like a plague right we have been cutting down trees in this space to add more light and sheep will come in in the spring and with those seed clay balls that I was making, this is where I'm planning on putting them. When I got here, the grandma who was looking after this place was still harvesting some of these citrus. And this one citrus, we actually can get a yield from. But there were a few more trees like this over the last, I guess from 10 years back, but this is really one of the only ones that remains. And it's because we've come in, just like the house, you know, again, this tree, we've come in at the right time to still continue to get a yield from this. And it's actually pretty uh, pretty sweet. Um, what kind? It's uh, Amanatsu. So Amai Natsu, right? Sweet summer citrus. And there's a few citrus here um, on it, a few immature ones. And then there's one mature one way up at the top. So having the sheep in here, when we, f we fenced this in last year in the winter, so the, our fence line runs up, and now we've tried to separate it into several sections. Um, we're working on expanding more land, just because every year as sheep ex number expands, we need a little bit more space to run the animals. Um, then they come through, they nibble at a lot of these weedy species, then that gives us uh, a chance to reseed it with clover, with things that are actually gonna build the soil up. Because what came back, a lot of the plants and trees that came back after this place was abandoned aren't really your broadleaf trees. And broadleaf trees drop big leaves like oaks, um, chestnuts. They, they drop a lot of uh, carbon material back into the soil. That breaks down and that's what builds your soil. Um, but you notice places will, here where we put some of our mulch or actually where we've had the, our sheep the soil is starting to build up and sometimes yeah, you can see little bits of uh, our Hitsuji Fun, right? Little, his pellets, his droplets here. And that's actually gonna build this soil back up. So then next we plant bushes or other things to really create an ecosystem again. Because what, was re what replaced you know, a monoculture of citrus is a lot of things that don't really build true ecosystems. So humans kind of coming back into contact with nature and instead of just leaving it, of course, 50, 100, 200 years um, later, yeah, maybe it'll become like a, a true ecosystem again, but that's gonna take a long time. People live here, we actually can do it a little bit faster than nature sometimes, than what nature can actually do. But using a lot of the principles that nature already provides without breaking it or destroying it, you know, or making it worse, we can, I think, make it better um, or make it more valuable in some cases not just for us but you know for a multitude of species um that you know now that we've cut some of these trees birds owls they can fly through here freely they can come in and eat they can get the you know the the voles the moles the uh, the mice that might run through here so it's balancing the ecosystem as opposed to just let's plant one thing uh, and that was done you know on these hills and on these islands for several years and we see that they're becoming abandoned year on year on year. Hiroshima is one of the most abandoned, uh, these Hiroshima Seta Naikai regions are one of the most abandoned farmlands in Japan. Um, and that's because it's still a lot of work. I mean, the hillside, the slope land, you can't bring in machinery here. You can't yield the same things like rice. So what are the benefits versus challenges for being on a slope? So, yeah, I mean, you know, we just, we, can't really bring in large-scale machinery or tools um, and sometimes you might need to bring those in those in especially when you first get started on a farm um, maybe having a big you know um, excavator tool would be really helpful because then you can actually concentrate where the water is going to flow through the farm you can even build swales or ponds or these kind of things through the farm so that when we do get these incredible rains that have been you know just yesterday looking at the new shizuoka they come through and they can wipe out you know huge swaths of area but that's because in japan there's little pockets of farms everywhere that you know 
full-scale holistic systems approach just hasn't really existed in the last uh, 100 years. I think it would exist previously, but we also aren't we didn't plan for the type of storms that we're now seeing. So now we have to rethink and replan the actuality of the situation, which is this incredible, you know, rainy season that we have, the incredible typhoons that we get. We have to replan and make new approaches. And I think instead of planning for, you know, the once in every 50 year flood or rain that comes, you know, we're now seeing that's happening every five years or every 10 years. Um, so when it wipes it all out, now is the time to kind of think about, oh, well, maybe we can rebuild to where it's not going to happen one in every 50. You know, it's one in every five years and, you know, really plan for that. So They like kale. Is that yeah. their favorite still? Yeah, kale. Um, weeds. And more, yeah, weeds, grasses. Uh, recently, Onomichi Brewery has been providing us with spent grain every week. Um, so that's their favorite. I mean, they will rip through the bag if I bring it close and they fight over it, but clearly... This is not, not for them, so the pigs, pigs will get it. <laughs> Bye guys. Walk down this way. Yeah, so you have a lot more area to cover for farming and other projects now, right? Right, yeah, yeah, which is, you know, it it's definitely brings about, you know, a, you know, sometimes it can be more stressful in, the, in that sense, but we kind of knew we wanted to plant and have more trees in and around our property. Um, so we've, you know, before and like in this space particularly, um, last year we just ran the sheep in here, um, and this year we have uh, first year citrus in this space. And in between the citrus this year, we planted beans and peas and garlic, and then we're planting uh, a winter crop just behind these um, citrus as well. Probably. Uh, some t some type of bean or maybe garlic a few rows of garlic through here because we're not tilling We're not gonna really damage the soil too much and we're not going to damage the roots of our citrus trees so we can really Afford we can actually afford to have other plants growing next to other plants without um, Compromising the space of the citrus maybe up until four or five years um, We'll be able to do that, but eventually the or orchard will start to come into some maturity and will rely less on having different vegetables in this area and just focus on having citrus up here but not doing the way in which people might clear cut all the grass and remove all the weeds we might have some natural grown vegetables like radishes or uh, clover and in and around the orchard and that'll bring in other uh, beneficial insects the daikon will work to kind of till around the soil so yeah, and having that combination of trees and vegetables, is that because of climate change becoming hotter, yeah. more shade We need as more well? shade, yeah, we need more shade plants and, you know, we just need to have, yeah, more, I think a more diverse space. If we're going to do it this, you know, if we're going to grow our citrus organically without sprays and chemicals, well, we need the, you know, beneficial insects as well. So instead of cutting all the grass and removing everything from the space and just growing citrus, yeah, we need a multitude of plants and uh, species um, to you know, live in this space. I, I don't think having just only citrus is going to be really good because um, it, it's, yeah, it, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to work, I, I think, from what I can see. Yeah, yeah okay. we have solar panels here and there and we we use uh, some lighting for solar mm -hmm. um, just at the other side right now but recently oh, we've had some problems sheep. yeah we've got, yeah we've kind of got them all separated out so she was the one on the left was born this year uh -huh. so when you came that's the left side is uh, lucky seven uh -huh. and then Nini was born last year so and we cute. think we found a home for Nini so we're getting ready to sell uh, sell her because uh -huh. yeah we just don't you know we really can't have so many animals on the property it's yeah. it's kind of it's kind of too much and there's other people that can use yeah yeah a local person wants to buy one so if they're going to buy it um that you know that saves us from the amount of grass that we have to manage and take care of oh. and, yeah and what are you growing here thomas ba uh so we're getting ready to transplant and seed a lot of stuff right now we've recently seeded some carrots here uh, and then we have basil and we have an empty bed right now that we're going to be transplanting Monday because it's going to rain on Tuesday. There's some onion, 
more basil. Do you ever get any? Yeah, there's a few right here. Oh, the banana flower. Do you yeah. ever eat the banana flower? I've heard it's pretty good, but it's I've never not, done it. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Cook it up with stir fry. Okay. And it doesn't taste like banana, but it smells and the aftertaste as you're eating it mm. is really banana-like. Mm. Yeah, we just, uh, yeah, just these bananas here. That's um, crazy that this area is tropical enough to grow bananas, I, isn't it? I guess it is now. <laughs> wow. Yeah, 30 degrees in, you know, in, in, October. in October. So That's crazy. Yeah, we're... Yeah, well, that and that's, you know, I mostly have the bananas here as a shade. Um, creates a little bit of privacy for the garden, but it also creates some shade. Um, recently, curry is really popular, like especially people wanting to do like, not the Japanese style, but like the Indian and, mm -hmm. you know, Sri Lanka curry. So like people want to come and buy our banana leaves. So, cool. you know, you've got this extra product that yeah. you know, normally wouldn't, I wouldn't have thought, oh, let's sell banana leaves to people, but I think it like, it's a beautiful, sustainable plate. Right. Yeah. Well, that's what, and that's what people want to use it for, right? John is the <gasps> compost you. machine. I hope she eats this. But Butch maybe John, what it's do you a little think? bitter. Do you like it? Oh, she's yeah. Yeah, she she goes for it. Good. Does Butchan have a family or just Butchan? Just Butchan. Yeah, she's female and. Um, Hopefully not pregnant. If she's pregnant, that means a wild boar got in, and hopefully she's no no babies. Um, but maybe that wouldn't be the worst thing, I guess. If we had some extra oh, pigs she, around. She likes it. Yep, she's. And pigs are supposed to be more intelligent than dogs. I think so, right? Very popular pets. Yeah, yeah. I mean, she's. And she's really like, I mean, if she does get out, which sometimes she does, she comes right to the front door and wants food. She's that's like, about Where's it. Where's my food? Yeah, that's really. I got about out. It. Do yeah. I get a treat? Yeah, she's. <laughs> that's her trick, you know. Yeah. And it's also, I think the female sheep is in, is in heat, and he, he escaped from over there earlier, and he's Houdini. <laughs> he is. He's like He's the, the magician. Escape, the escape master. Yeah. Other sheep. Um, we've introduced the new male. So he's getting a rest uh, this year. So, but he's, he's, he's pretty, pretty awesome. Very different than that sheep in terms of personality. That one's still pretty uh, sheepish towards me, but <laughs> he is, he's not. And he's quite, uh, he's kind of proud, proud sheep looks like eating uh, do you still use your greenhouse probably in winter right what it was we just finished uh, summer crop this past week we cropped everything out and every and this week it's gonna get reseeded so it's still like for me it's just too hot to seed stuff in the greenhouse right now because of our schedule and because of everything we've got going on I wouldn't be able to come here and have it watered multiple times but from this week um, I plan on seeding it. It's looking like it's going to rain on Tuesday, so get some cloud cover, and that's a good time to seed. But I don't want to rush anything because I don't want to waste my seeds right now, too. Um, so timing is, you know, so crucial. I, mean, I have a little bit of problem right now in my transplants too. Most of them have been hit with the increased amount of grasshoppers that are now, you know, decimating a lot of the trans the new seeds. So it's like, well, what do we do? You know, well, how do we, you know, how do I plant? How do I transplant? You know, I'm, I'm making, I'm, you know, buying in soil, putting in the seed, you know, I'm doing all this work. But what I'm finding is actually the stuff that's naturally gone to seed, the kale, the mustard greens, the um, bok choy that's up here actually is now growing in, you know, uh, by the, you know, just in, in piles up here on the top of the farm. So instead of actually doing it down here this year and seed and working so hard to seed stuff, I'm actually just gonna pull that out of the ground at the right time and plant that. And those plants are typically stronger than ones I've put in pots and had to transplant. They often have transplant shock and then you have to water more, you have to put shade nets over. But the ones that are just growing wild or naturally in nature are so much more, um, you know, resilient. so much resilient, you know, so much more resilient to what 
um, to what I could even do myself down below. So I can show you that just up here. So we've got composting here. And last year, Buchan was here. Okay. So she was here. She kind of created the compost. Now she's there. Next, we'll probably put her back here. She'll eat a lot of these grasses and weeds. Um, we've also got compost here. It came off the the shrine. Uh, so the, the tree uh, Kusunoki uh, puts out these leaves every year. And typically, our community city cleaning project is to take these leaves and put them in plastic bags, take them to the waste center and burn them. I said, what are we doing? Like, why don't, you know, why can't we, why can't we compost these? Well, now I'm the, the village composter. <laughs> you just volunteered. I just volunteered. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why sometimes I think people don't open their mouths <laughs> in, in Japan sometimes, because they don't want to be the guy that is now responsible for everybody's garbage and waste. And so recently the wild boar came in ate all of our sweet potatoes oh. or I like to think of it as he tilled it up the land for us so <laughs> um, so we've now to get this new bed started uh, we'll be planting garlic in here and then with this extra uh, cut grass or cut mulch mulch we'll just mulch that on top once the garlic comes out and that'll keep our uh, garlic happy through the winter so we're working on that it's hard to practice no-till all the time. Uh, same here, I did no-till broadcast of daikon, and some of them have made it, but that initial sweet uh, germinated daikon seed is, uh, yeah, is really tasty, I think. So the boar came in and picked off those. But what he didn't find, or maybe what he did find, is earthworm soil, he tilled that up, but when he tilled it up a little bit, I always, in spring I always let a lot of plants naturally flower and naturally go to seed. So as I was talking about down there, we now have uh, 200 or 300 kale transplants. So I'm not going to have to seed kale this year because it's here. And this kale, um, once it gets to its true leaf stage, so this isn't really true leaf stage, leaf stage. So once it gets to this new leaf stage, um, it'll go to the true leaf stage. The true leaf stage, we're gonna take this plant out and we can transplant it down below in our market garden. And we'll have that growing uh, throughout January and February. So this is really a way of, um, you know, saving on seed, saving on time, saving on you know energy, saving on buying in, you know, uh, soil from outside and the plant germinates and comes out at the right time it knows you know it knows when to come out it knows this is it this is what I this is the time to be alive and that's what we get here in this space but we have that in several pockets around the farm uh, another space up here another bed has um, the bok choy I mentioned that's kale there's some daikon th down through here uh, the first and second typhoon knocked down a lot of the kikuimo, but now it's fallen down and now the uh, citrus are really shining. So maybe it's okay, you know? And maybe this, you know, the whole process of having the kikuin, kikuimo or Jerusalem artichoke in here for this long, maybe it's not, um, maybe it's time for it to be finished. Maybe we need to take it and plant it in our new spaces or um, maybe there's some c kind of carrying capacity for the amount of kikuimo we also had here. And that's something that I didn't think about it when I first planted it uh, three or four years ago. And I didn't think it would actually um, cover as much ground as it actually has. But um, the last two or three years, we've been harvesting, you know, 50 to 100 kgs of the plant a year. So maybe this year is going to be the off year. And, we have to think about those kind of things, you know. What's the care and capacity of the plants that surround the space? Same with that space of kale. Maybe it's better to pull those kale plants out and replant them somewhere else. Sheep also have a carrying capacity. So we have to think about that in this kind of space, in this context. You mean like resting the, the soil Re in between or taking turns in different areas? Taking turns in different areas, but also maybe, this, so this kikuimo drew some artichoke 
th what's regrown here is, is the plants that we didn't actually uh, harvest last year. And maybe in some cases we should have harvested more or maybe the flowers drop their seed and there's just too much. So it no longer can stand up and be health, a truly healthy uh, stand of uh, Jerusalem artichoke. So what do we do in that case? Well, maybe this coming, uh, this coming year or next year, as it's coming up again, maybe we just cut it back every time. We don't give it a chance to actually grow and flourish like we would normally. And uh, that becomes mulch and food for all the things that are living in the soil it breaks down and also becomes food for our orchard which is really what we were trying to establish in the first place we you know i don't imagine growing vegetables on the top of this farm forever because it's just too much work our flat spaces and our new space that's flat and easy access of water those are the spaces that i think we should concentrate vegetable growing and on hills you know citrus do well and you know they they need a, a well-drained soil to prevent disease and other problems so l focus on what grows well and what space so those are some things we're now really you know reevaluating and i think that reevaluation has to take place you know year in and year out you know um it's the same with you know how you grow vegetables the market for the product um, we're always kind of reevaluating like what we need to do on the farm um, without, you know, with also out without being too overwhelmed too, because it is a lot of space, you know, and it's me and my wife mostly managing it. Um, but we also have to start to reevaluate that as our farm and our business grows, you know, maybe we bring in employees, maybe we have people working here on the farm, and that's something we need to look forward to in the future too, because. Um, you know, mentally and physically, we have our own ca carrying capacity or... Yeah, that's know. also part of sustainability. Right, right. Uh, Was that's it enough. Hard, hard to get certified as a farmer? I don't think so. I think it's just paperwork and, you know, but getting access to the land, that might be trickier for some people. Um, your relatives might have land. Uh, your neighbors might have, even if you're living in an urban area, they might have land, you know, 20, 30 minutes outside of that urban area so you know it's good to ask around and um, get feedback from people if you want to start growing uh, in Japan you know look at your municipality homepage they have a section for farming they have a section for uh, fishing they have a section for forestry go and look at that page if you can't read it Google Translate works well so translate it they'll translate it for you most of the information although Japan they use a lot of PDFs so if Google Translate doesn't automatically uh, translate the PDFs but maybe you can use some kind of app to translate that for you and if you want to find out like I can find out what's the average price of rented land and I think Makaishima is a bit more expensive for rented farmland than other uh, more isolated islands like Inoshima um, if you want to buy farmland you you need to be certified if you want to rent I don't think so but the rent is your is your ticket in you know it's it's your access to purchasing farmland in the future so you should rent first and you should probably rent first before you th want to think about farming i mean give it a try give it a try you know um because it's you know it's not for everybody maybe yeah. maybe i mean i don't know I, maybe it is maybe it isn't we you know i i, I saw an article what a in the 1800s, 50% or 45% of Americans were farmers, right? Japan's probably 60-70%. Um, fortunately, we don't all have to farm. You know, we, there's multiple opportunities for work and employment now, which is really great. But in Japan, the fact that there's so much abandoned land and so many beautiful places like this, um, you know, there are a lot of opportunities for growing and um, you know starting a farm and I could see a lot more people doing it but uh, and hopefully more doing it on this more um, you know on the side of uh, more biodiversity uh, organic or natural regenerative style farming and we need more people doing it because we need more you know we also need more leaders you know in the field you know, like trying to figure out how to do it that's the, one of the issues is you know, came here and to kind of feel like you're pioneering the space is is it's good and kind of can be satisfac 
satisfying at some times, but it can also be somewhat, um, you know, lonely, I guess, you know, not to have those networks and connections. Uh, but fortunately with the internet, with Facebook, like we've created a like, foreign farmers of Japan site, which what I found is people who are, you know, have come from outside in Japan, maybe want to do things a little bit differently, or they've seen something in a different way, and they've seen the land in a different way. Um, so groups like that really help, but also getting in touch with local farmers and knowing and seeing what they're growing. You're going to get a lot of feedback and information from them, so that's uh, really valuable. Thanks for watching. And big thanks to Thomas and Cody for giving me a walk around of their new project. I'm really excited to see how it's developing um, over the next time I go visit. Can't wait to go see how they're doing. Um, it's also really interesting to me to see and hear his philosophy as he's evolving as a farmer. Did you have any questions or comments? Make sure to leave them below and we'll get back to you. Also, if you haven't already, please subscribe. Have a great day. Take care. To find out more about Pitchfork Farms, find them on pitchforkfarms.jp. You can also find them on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter.